The 1979 NFL season was the grand finale to ten memorable years. A season worthy of the decade's curtain call. NFL 79, an incredible year. Nineteen seventy nine had its share of oddities and rarities, as well as such familiar rituals as one athlete going head to head against another. Like other years, there were new stars to watch, but this season's group shone brighter than usual. Established names continued to flourish. There were come downs and comebacks. Some souls lost and forgotten returned to prominence, while others punctuated storied careers with one last hurrah. 1979 featured a constant battle of wills, strength against strength. More so than before, those who hit harder, ran faster, and threw farther won the most acclaim. In that respect, 1979 was abundant with heroes. A rousing conclusion to a rousing football decade. This was NFL 79. Nineteen seventy nine was a year when old cliches no longer stood up and time honored theories came tumbling down. For years, experts have said if you can run, you can win. Well, last season, the St. Louis Cardinals, led by number thirty two Otis Anderson, gained more yards running than any team in the NFC. But they couldn't win and finished dead last in the Eastern Division. It has always been true that the most successful teams make the fewest mistakes. Not so in 1979. The world champion Pittsburgh Steelers often resemble the college fraternity touch football team well into its third keg of beer. They led the league in fumbles, bumbles, and turnovers, but they also led the league in victories. In San Diego, the Chargers barbecued another sacred cow. Every season, the computer tells us a team that passes more than it runs is doomed. Last season, Don Coriel, the head coach of the Chargers, defied the odds and contradicted the computer. Coriel's Chargers passed more than they ran, and at the end of the year, they were champions of the AFC West. To all teams everywhere, winning was still the only thing. And it seemed that the best way to win was to throw. Riding the crest of this wonderful wave of offense were the wide receivers. They were the lonesome cowboys of the NFL, gunning down defenders in man-to-man -man duels, then galloping off through the wide open spaces. Wide receivers of 79, men like young John Jefferson of the Chargers.
and Ahmad Rashad, number 28 of the Minnesota Vikings, an old veteran who led the NFC in pass receptions. And when the occasion called for last-second heroics, no one was better than Cleveland's Red G. Rucker. 52 seconds to play. Sight back to throw. He throws in the end zone. It is a touchdown! Week after week, pass catchers prove that dash and dexterity can be as impressive as brute force and ultimately more successful. intricate and sophisticated pass patterns this year. Just everybody out for a long one. are the men with the gift of grab, men who could snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. 80,000 plus cheering the Browns on. We're in sudden death. Back to throw. Side looks and throws it deep to Rucker. He's open. Touchdown! It's over! Reggie Rucker. Pass from sight. He wins the ball game. A 39-yard pass given. That's his eighth reception of the afternoon. The Browns in a season of startling upsets, wide receivers were Sunday's heroes. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers became a member of the National Football League in 1976. They were a motley crew of castoffs, cranks, and cripples. Their head coach, John McKay, came from the University of Southern California, where he was unaccustomed to defeat and disorder. We went through eight quarterbacks. Every time I looked up, uh, start that guy. Uh, we had no audible system because we had the left guard was from Nova Scotia and the right guard was from, we just picked up from Philadelphia. They barely knew each other's name. The Bucks stumbled at the starting gate, then went straight downhill. They were America's belly laugh. Tampa Bay went on to lose 26 games in a row and were ridiculed as the worst team in the history of professional football. Then came the incredible transformation that saw them go from worst to first. In 1979, Tampa Bay's aggressive defense led the NFC in nearly every department and a previously pitiful offense was revitalized by emerging stars like running back Ricky Bell and quarterback Doug Williams. Although conservative on offense, the Buccaneers won nine of their first 12 games, causing critics to presume that head coach John McKay was pulling rabbits out of his hat. By the 13th week, the Bucks were one game away from the playoffs as the McKay plan ran ahead of schedule. One step from the playoffs, this rags to riches story began to unravel against the Minnesota Vikings. have to kick a damn extra before we get in there. We haven't made one yet. We haven't even blocked anybody yet. 
Place kicker Neil O'Donohue's extra point try was blocked as the Bucks on this day proved unworthy of the Central Division crown. At least you ought to block somebody in there. Get out there, you idiot! No guts at the throwing dice. We got an excuse for every damn thing we do. The numbing defeat set off a chain reaction of three straight losses. Angry fans called their team the Chokineers. And worse, as Tampa Bay became infected with gallows humor. After the Minnesota game, Neil O'Donoghue tried to commit suicide. He put a gun to his head, but somebody blocked it. You see my watch? It's been the only consistent buccaneer since they were born. <laughs> it's never stopped running. And what we needed was Newt Rockney, and he was not here. We will attempt to come back next Sunday in Tampa Stadium in front of our own crowd. We've now proven we can't play on the road or in front of our own crowd. So we, we, we would like to have a neutral site. On Sunday, December 16th, under the worst possible conditions, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had one last chance to right all the wrongs and redeem their championship dreams against the Kansas City Chiefs. For more than three quarters, they slogged and sloshed, mired in a scoreless tie. Then, with two minutes left on the clock, the Bucks finally got their chance to cash in on a championship. 19-yard field goal attempt. Neil O'Donoghue. The rain has let up a great deal. Awaiting the snap from Steve Wilson. It is a low snap. The kick is up. Go! The players are really whooping it up on the sidelines. This is quite a sight to see. The Buccaneers are the NFC Central Division champions, and we are popping the champagne. The 1979 Tampa Bay Buccaneers, from worst to first. For the 16 weeks of the regular season, pro football is just a game. But in December, when the playoffs begin, it becomes a civic movement, and each city rallies behind its team for the final push to the Super Bowl. In Pittsburgh, the Steelers easily defeated the Dolphins. But in other cities, the playoffs reflected the regular season as underdogs frolicked and upsets flourished. There was no brotherly love in Philadelphia as the Eagles beat up the Bears. But the next week, the Buccaneers went through Philadelphia like the Metroliner and crushed the favored Eagles with a smartly executed game plan of hard running and accurate passing. Bum Phillips and his Houston Oilers reminded us all that football is a game of guts as well as game plans. Playing without Dan Pastorini and Earl Campbell and with half their defense playing hurt, Houston seemed certain to lose to the high-scoring Chargers. But the Oilers drew inspiration from adversity and whipped San Diego in a stunning upset, 17 to 14.
the game, we were short on manpower, but we were long on guts, and I'm damn sure right. Guts alone cannot win championships, and Bum's brave bunch was overpowered by the Steelers in the AFC championship game. Now, I don't think anybody can beat Pittsburgh except Houston, and we didn't. Houston's season ended in Pittsburgh. In Dallas, the Los Angeles Rams season was really just beginning. Of all the teams in the playoffs, the Rams have the poorest regular season record. But against the Cowboys, they cast aside their underdog image, like Clark Kent's business suit, and emerged as the surprising new super team of the NFC. I, I've been around football all my life. That's the best damn effort I've seen any team my whole career ever get. The following week in Tampa Bay, three swings of Frank Corral's foot defeated the Bucks and sent the Los Angeles Rams homeward bound to Pasadena for their first Super Bowl ever. with all the other players. And we've been through hell this year. We really have. And we all stuck together. Remember, we, we got one more to get. Yeah, well, we got one more to get. Let's, yeah, go get. let's go get Pittsburgh's ass. Get Pittsburgh. That has been the futile battle cry of every team in the NFL. Not since Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers has one team so dominated pro football. Other team challenges its opponents with as many skilled athletes. Franco Harris, Terry Bradshaw, Lynn Swan and John Stallworth, Joe Green and Jack Lambert. They had already played in three Super Bowls and never lost. And now the Steelers look to close out the decade with yet another world championship. Super Bowl 14, Rams versus Steelers. One team defending its title, the other out to shed a loser's label. Many observers tab the game as a mismatch, but from the start, the Steelers and Rams played a surprisingly even power game inside the trenches. The first sign of Ram defiance came from number 26, Wendell Tyler. Tyler showed the steel curtain might not be impregnable. Then Ram quarterback Vince Ferragamo erased all doubt. Using every tactical maneuver their playbook offered, the Rams led for much of the game. The possibility of an upset now seemed imaginable. But the Pittsburgh Steelers did not become three-time world champs by accident. They set out to catch the Rams, then reclaim the lead for their own. Lynn Swan's touchdown grab was a vivid reminder of the Steelers' ability to strike at will. 
Then quarterback Terry Bradshaw and number 82, John Stallworth, encored with a passing performance of their own. Final score, Steelers 31, Rams 19. For an unprecedented fourth time, the Vince Lombardi Trophy, football's most cherished prize, belonged to the Pittsburgh Steelers, despite the noble efforts of a courageous Los Angeles Rams team. NFL 79 ended the same way it began with the Pittsburgh Steelers reigning as kings of the professional football world.